this was a charnel pit, a room of death, heaped with many mingled bones where the dead had been tossed for untold years, scores of them. <laughs> in the haunted castle. Far away and long ago, there was a castle in the border kingdoms that stood empty and ruinous, for its folk had long fled, and the forest had swiftly reclaimed their steadings and taverns and mills. Even bold wayfarers feared to go anywhere near, for word had spread that the once fair keep was haunted by a severed head that whispered fell secrets in ears and then flew away. Or hung watching from afar, a sad-eyed, beautiful young lady with no body to call her own. Once she'd been the lady of the castle, before her father, the Baron Narlaver the Jest, took deathly ill, and parents were sent for, and found poison in him and spell quenched it. Soon after, the priests in turn fell ill and soon died, and the talk was that they'd been poisoned. And then the Baron fell ill again, and suspicion fell on all within the castle, and folk watched each other in cold fear as the Baron grew weaker and took to his bed and awaited the hands of the gods to gather him. One morn to that castle of High Rock, there came a stranger, a tall and handsome man, who claimed to be a priest of a god that none in that keep had ever heard of, and he forced his way to the Baron and gave him a drink that brought back his strength in a trice. And that priest told Narlaver the Just that his own daughter was the serpent within his doors, who'd poisoned him and worked a magic that showed the Baron his beloved Avena crushing spiders, so their venom dripped into a vial, which the priest vowed was the very poison that had laid the Baron low. And the Baron was wroth and raged and sent his guards to drag Avena from her chambers and to him, where he, without pause, drew his sword and beheaded her as they held her, deeming her witch and foul poisoner as he hacked and she shrieked. He fell to his knees and wept after he'd slain his only daughter, for his wife had died in childbirth years before, and he was now alone in the world. Yet his grief proved not long, for the next day he was stricken worse than ever before, so weak he could no longer lift the sword he'd so furiously swung, and he was pale and soon wandering witted withal, and died in his bed as the folk of the castle whispered to each other that it was the poison once more. So the Lady of Aina had been innocent, or or her ghost had somehow poisoned her sire. And so ended the line of Narlaver the Just, and the folk of the castle bided in his fair halls not long after he was put in his crypt. For the severed head of the Lady of Aina was seen flying about the chambers, whispering her innocence, and that the living should bring down doom upon the real poisoner. And after a ten day of her whispers coming suddenly into ears, most of the folk of the castle had fled, taking what valuables they could with them. And the fair castle of High Rock stood nigh empty, which was when murderous outlaws stole out of the forest and hacked down the tall, handsome priest of the unknown god when he refused to let them into his castle and took it for their own, slaughtering or driving out the few folk of the just baron who'd remained. And so, High Rock became their seat, and from it they made the roads perilous and the countryside fearful, and folk came not near. And the forest crept back in, and farms faded beneath saplings, and Narlaver the just became but a memory. Now it happened that then in the border kingdoms, seven younger sons who were out in the world seeking their fortunes met by chance in a tavern in Durlusk and liked each other well enough to band together as adventurers. They called themselves the Swords of Hope, or Hope Swords, but 
They found that bringing hope was ill-paid work, so in time were forced to accept a hiring from the innkeeper of Hawkrun, the next town along the road from High Rock. Uh, both places are long gone today. That hiring was to rid the roads of the outlaws of High Rock, to make the roads safe again, so the Hawk Inn would once more be full of travelers and its hearth merry. So the Swords of Hope set forth, skulking and watching like hunters or scouts, and so they saw the outlaws before they were seen. As the ruffians of High Rock were bent upon a raid upon Hawkrun to take goats and sheep and oxen, they did so too, driving the beasts alive back to their castle to roast and feast. And the Seven Swords of Hope sought to sneak into the castle to slay once the outlaws were snoring drunk, but had no count of the outlaws, so well they spotted the first sentinel and slipped past. They marked not the second, and so were spotted and ambushed. Two swords fell in a few frantic moments, and the rest fled, but knew not the castle nor the forest around, and were one after another caught and hacked down dead, until only the youngest, most timid, and fastest sword of hope was left. Imreth was his name. Imreth, son of Lathra the Quiet Lady of Undlemir. He had run deeper into the castle, which was filthy and dark, but could hear the outlaws drawing nearer and became aware from their shouts that they were carefully hemming him in. He was doomed. Likely, even if he only faced one of them, and there were a dozen at least, he would die, horribly, and very soon. Imreth retreated from room to room until he was in bedchambers, and by the smell found a garderobe, and it was as far back as he could go. His pursuers knew it by their chuckles of satisfaction. He was going to die here. He was going to... unless... The hole was just big enough, and Imreth set his teeth and plunged through it, down the garda road shaft, into the human cess below. It was wet, it was sloppy, and the stink was terrible. He slipped, fetched up against an unclean wall, and in the dark groped along it, seeking a way out. Soon he bumped his head on stone. The ceiling was lowering. He might trapped here. Despairing, Imreth felt his way along, at least out of the filth, but despairing until he tripped and almost fell. His boots had struck steps? Steps up? Could it be? They were. A flight of worn stone steps that took him towards dim light. A room with a lone high window, an opening that the wind and weather could drift through and the sunlight could fall to show him this was a charnel pit, a room of death, heaped with many mingled bones where the dead had been tossed for untold years, scores of them. Skulls rolled underfoot as Imbreth saw a door in its far wall up another flight of steps and made for it only to feel fresh icy dread as eerie glows kindled all around him and dark and rotten bones rose up into the air all around him amid a whistling moan that keened higher and higher as the bones began to whirl around him, battering him until he flung his hands up in front of his face to save his eyes and ran blindly for the stairs, only to trip over something hard and squared to fall on his face amid a hail of bludgeoning bones. He struggled to his feet, cursing at the pain in his shins, and as the wails of the undead became a shrill shriek around him, Imreth found himself staring at an iron box, which was when the door he'd been fighting to reach burst open, and the outlaws stared into the whirling bones and gave him cold, unfriendly grins. There you are, little scared rabbit. Come to us. Aye, come and die. Imrest tried to back away, but the outlaws charged down the steps, hacking whirling bones out of the way with shouts of glee. They were upon him. He'd lost his sword somewhere back in the muck. He was going to... 
Desperately, he snatched up the iron box to use as a shield to fend off the swords, even now hacking at him, and the first sword crashed into the box and rent it. Iron shards flying, and out of it something soared that made the whirling bones swirl back like fish fleeing a shark, something that flew at the outlaws. Imreth found himself staring at a human head female by the look of its long, swirling tresses, darting at the faces of the outlaws with purpose and... Fury? You, she whispered, anger high in her hiss, have brought darkness to the fair name of the just barony. You slew my father's slayer, but what you have done since I utterly abhor. Get you gone! and she slammed into the face of the foremost outlaw and bit his nose, and he shrieked in terror and surprise, dropping his sword with a clang in his haste to flee. And in a trice, they were all gone, and the door slammed behind them, leaving Imreth free to clutch for that fallen sword before the flying head turned and served him the same way. Yes, he had it, firm and heavy in his hand, and he looked up to find himself nose to nose with the saddest, palest, most beautiful face he'd ever seen. Uh, I... <laughs> well met, lady, he stammered, not knowing what to say, and was rewarded with a wry smile. And who were you, sir, who dived down dungles in my castle? Uh, um, I... I am the last of the Swords of Hope. Uh, Imreth is my name. Uh, Imreth, son of Lathra, the Quiet Lady of Undelmere. And I am uh, likely the worst adventurer for hire in the Border Kingdoms. I can flee like the wind, but uh, have not yet found much else I'm good at. I crave pardon for my intrusion, Lady... Uh, Lady... Lady Avena Martever, daughter of Narlever called the Just, the Baron who built this castle. So it is mine now. Her whisper was gentle, almost friendly, and Imrest dared to give her a smile in return, and asked, And may I be welcome as your guest for long enough to find my way out and uh, trouble you no more? Out? To find your death at the hands of those wolf blades? Is my home too lowly for you to stay? Uh, no, 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 not at all. I, I merely wish to avoid giving offense. I begin to like you, Sir Imreth. I am in need of a champion. And I wonder, if I were to show you the secret passages of my castle, and where my father's blade of justice lies hidden, would you aid me in ridding my halls of yon miscreants? Uh, I'll try, Imres replied and knelt to offer the hilt of the blade he just snatched up. And the smile she gave him then made the bones sink down all over the chamber with despairing moans and move and make sound no more. Long was their skulking partnership, stealing out in silence to stab one outlaw after another when they could catch each wolf blade alone. And the Lady of Aena swooped to confound and blind and even trip the outlaws as Imreth fought them. And Imreth found the blade of justice so sharp and keen that it sliced bones and brawn alike as if they were soft churned butter, so he could slay the wolf blades with ease. Imreth never learned to like ending a life, even those of such evil louts as these outlaws, but he did the necessary butchery with a tireless resolve that he could tell the bodiless lady approved of. Came the day when the last of the outlaws lay bleeding at Imbreth's feet, and the last of the Swords of Hope looked up in satisfaction at the Lady of Aena, and found her smile sad as she thanked him and added, I beg, when you depart these halls, you leave me the blade of justice you wield, it's all I have left of my family now. Imreth felt himself blushing, but kept his gaze on hers as he replied that he had no intention of leaving. 
Lady, I have found my purpose and place. I'll be thy champion henceforth, uh, if you'll have me. And her smile then was as bright as the rising moon. They say in the borders that Imreth of the Just Blade lived long and well, with the head of the lady he served flying at his shoulder. And they were fast friends who made many firm friendships with others, so that while Imreth and Hyrock are gone today, the memory of the Just Blade lasts, and folk still see the head of a lady flying under the moon, whispering sad wisdom to this day. Hi, welcome back to Realm Speak, and this time around, we're doing this. Kelimbor. That poor sod. I mean, no, that, that poor mortal who became a god. Then deals with the dying. The poor guy. Kelivor was a human minding his own business until the events of the Avatar trilogy, the time of troubles. When, I think it's Kelivor Lionsbane? He, he's one of the adventurers. Midnight was another. Cyric was yet another. And these three um, became deities. Um, be careful what you wish for. Really be careful what you wish for. Um, so Kelimbor is the sympathetic um, god of the dead. Kelimbor, you know, he's sad you had to die. Um, he wants to look after your soul. And not in the way that, you know, certain other religions want your soul. Uh, he wants to he wants to make sure your soul is, you know, at peace, in the right place, and, and is guided. And yeah, that's what he does. Kalimbor, 